Something I hear a lot from the people I work with is this idea that no matter how hard they work or how successful they become, there's something about them that just never quite feels good enough. There can be many different reasons why this idea gets stuck in our head. And in this video, I'm gonna cover just a few of them and explain how to shift our thinking so that we're no longer held back by that thought. I'm Tim Box, Mind Coach, and this is three reasons we don't ever feel good enough and what we can do about that. Okay, let's get straight into it. The first reason why we don't feel good enough Parents. Now, before I go any further, yes, I know it feels like a cliche to put all the blame for our hardships on our parents, but it's no secret that all of our early learnings come from them. So the attitude our parents display is more often than not in some way the origins of how we feel about who we are. Now, I'm not seeking to make a judgment on the quality of anyone's parenting here because even the best parent will inevitably have accidentally installed certain beliefs and responses that they'd rather they hadn't simply because of their own limitations. So let's not be too down on our parents because it's a tough job and we can't possibly get every aspect of it right. That being said, when we start out in life, the approval of our parents is the most important thing. We're looking to them for indicators of what's good or bad, what's right or wrong. At the end of the day, we need to keep them on side because they're the ones looking after us and keeping us alive. Now, there are many ways that their attitude can have us concluding certain negative things about our self-worth, whether that be because they never showed us enough love or appreciation, so we decided we mustn't be worthy of it, or because our parents were so keen for us to succeed that they kept driving us to do better and then just gave us the impression that we could never satisfy them and that must be our fault for not being good enough. The mistake we make in these instances is in accepting that the opinions of others, even our parents, represent a valid and accurate assessment of our worth. Yes, as a child, we're very much a blank slate to be written on, but that quickly changes as we start to develop our own ideas. And there is a point, and let's face it, pretty early on in life, where our parents stop being the expert in the room about exactly who we are, what we have to offer, and what we actually want from life. So here's the thing, if I want an opinion on something, I'm always best advised to speak to an expert. So if I want an opinion on plumbing, I'll ask a plumber. If I want advice on a legal matter, I'll ask a lawyer. And if I want an opinion on me, I'll ask the expert. And guess who's the world's leading expert on me? It's not my parents, because they haven't been present at every moment in my life. It's me. My opinion of myself overrides any others because nobody knows me as well as I do. So what that means is that any ideas we get about our worth or our value that come from the attitude displayed by our parents can very quickly be rejected when they stop being the expert. If our parents don't see our worth, then we can simply file that alongside the long list of things we inevitably disagree with our parents on. For all the opinions and advice we might accept from others, always remember, nobody decides what you're worth except you. Okay, the second reason we might have a low self-worth is perspective. We often look at others and decide we just aren't doing as well as them. They seem to be achieving more. They seem to be living a better life. They don't seem to be struggling quite as much. Social media is a good place to go if you really want to take a knock in your own self-esteem. But it's often said that comparison is the thief of joy, and there's a good reason for this. When we compare ourselves to others, we inevitably have a warped and distorted perspective. All we see of other people is the surface stuff, the highlights, the things they want us to see. Whereas what we see of our own journey includes all the mistakes and missteps. In the movie of our life, we see our own behind the scenes footage and outtakes that would ideally never actually make the final cut. When we compare our outtakes to their highlights, we don't measure up too well. Yet always remember, their perspective is exactly the opposite. They see our highlights whilst being all too aware of their own outtakes. Look, it's okay that our perspective inevitably gives us a distorted viewpoint, as long as we're aware that the way we compare ourselves to others is misrepresentative, it's not real. Don't try and be better than others because you're inevitably stacking the odds against yourself. Simply seek to be better than you were yesterday and allow every mistake, because there will be many, to become the building blocks of a better you. Okay, the third reason we might suffer low self-image is proof. As we've just stated, we're gonna make lots of mistakes in our life. It's how we learn, it's part of our process. But if we're already harboring the idea that we're just not good enough, then all those mistakes serve to do is to reinforce the negative self-image we carry around with us. 
The reason for this is that we have part of our mind called the reticular activating system that pretty much decides what comes into our awareness and what gets filtered out. It's important because we inevitably can't be consciously aware of everything that goes on around us from moment to moment. So our brain has to select where our focus goes. It's why we notice when someone drives past us in the same make and model of car and why certain words like our name or a subject we're interested in will jump out of random conversations that strangers are having in the same room as us and suddenly come into our awareness. We notice these things because something about them is regarded in our mind as relevant to us. So how does your reticular activating system decide what you notice and what you don't? Well, it's kind of like a social media algorithm. If we click the like button on a post that someone's put up, then the algorithm decides that this is content you're interested in and it will show you more of that type of stuff. If you've ever Googled something you want to buy someone as a gift, you'll have experienced this effect when suddenly the ads on your socials are showing you more of the same sort of stuff, even though you really aren't interested in it. Your mind is running its own algorithm when it needs to decide what you're going to notice and what you're going to ignore. So let's imagine that one of the things you regard as true is that you're just not good enough. What's then going to happen is that you'll notice all the things that reinforce that idea. You'll be very aware of your own shortcomings and focus on your mistakes. Conversely, your mind will filter out of your awareness all the things you do well, all the tasks you achieve each day. None of that gets factored in because it just doesn't fit into your algorithm. So we end up constantly collecting evidence that keeps us locked in the opinion that we'd rather wasn't true. But we can do something about this. When we want to see different content on our social media, we go to the search bar and type in the stuff we want to see. And this is kind of what we need to do for ourselves when it comes to changing the things we naturally notice. We might need to start by actively drawing our attention to the things we're doing well, allowing ourselves to notice and be proud of the little things that we are achieving. We have a bad habit when we suffer low self-esteem of rejecting the things we do achieve as one of those easy things that pretty much anyone can do. We do this because obviously what we're doing can't be that great or unusual because after all, we're not very good. So if we can do it, surely anyone can. But if we really wanna change our algorithm, we have to stop making this assumption and start to appreciate the steps we take every day. Actively look to recognize and congratulate yourself for the things you get done. Start to regard the things you get wrong as valuable steps forward. Stop beating yourself up and putting yourself down. Correct that opinion of yourself. The more you do this consciously and deliberately, the more you'll start to naturally notice the positives and automatically filter out the negatives. So there you have it, three reasons we don't feel good enough and what we can do about that. Guys, I hope this video was of value. If so, please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe as I put new videos up every week all about shifting the way we think and improving the way we respond. Also, take a look at the podcast I do with my wife every week called Thinking Outside the Box for a slightly different take than the norm on how we manage our mental health. But that's all for now. I'm Tim Box, Mind Coach. Remember to be kind to your mind and I'll see you next time.